I started Delicious Yellow back in 2012. It was in reaching rock bottom that I realized, I guess, that my life was in my hands and my hands only. I had nothing in my life. I was sleeping 18 hours a day. I had chronic pain. I was so dizzy. I felt like I couldn't move. I looked more pregnant at that point than I did when I was almost eight months pregnant with my daughter. I mean, nothing in my body worked and I felt so apathetic that I just didn't really see any reason to be here. Because we live in 24 hour news cycles and because of the algorithms that drive social media, the weird and the wacky, the fads, the clickbait, driving headlines and content ultimately do much better. So like most of us could walk for 15 minutes today. Yes. Most of us could go to bed 30, 60 minutes earlier, watch a little bit less Netflix. Mm -hmm. Most of us could stop scrolling a tiny bit. Yes. These are really achievable goals, but they're not very interesting to talk about. Right. There is a lot of glamorization around entrepreneurship and starting a business and your hashtag girl boss. I'd say you spend most of your life feeling like you live in some kind of tumble dryer and the level of pressure and stress and responsibility is so all consuming. People loved it. They were like, delicious yellow. Basically goes into administration. She is really a moron after all. People like to equate privilege as like a pathway. So they'll say, Ella, you were privileged, so you were able to do everything. Is that true? Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of A Millennial Mind. Before we get into this podcast, I wanna tell you all about my weekly live Sunday workshops. A lot of people ask how I was able to quit the corporate rat race and do something that I love every single day, and that's by working on myself and doing so many different things to do with my self-development. So every Sunday, I host a workshop focusing on different topics from manifesting to the law of attraction to goal setting to how I manage my time, and you can join too. There's a three-day free trial. I'll leave the link in the comments, but for now, let's get into the episode. Ella. Hello. Hi, thank you for having me. Well, welcome. I'm so happy to have you on the show. And this is a podcast I've been waiting to do for maybe a couple of years now. So I'm so happy we finally get to sit down and do it. Me too. Me too. I'm really excited to get into so many different things with you because I feel like lots of people are talking around a plant-based diet. Lots of people are trying to be healthier, live longer, get better skin. You know, it's a real big focus at the moment. But before we get into all of that, for people who don't know who you are, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, right. Okay, I'll do it in a nutshell, because otherwise <laughs> I don't want to take up the whole episode. Um, but I've cut a very long story short. Um, I'm Ella, and I started Delicious Yellow back in 2012, which feels like a very long time ago now. And it was all because I'd got very ill. So back in 2011, when I was at university, out of nowhere, really, I got very, very ill. And I spent the most of that year in that hospital. And I hit a real rock bottom. I was so isolated. I was so alone. I was so uncomfortable in feeling so different and so vulnerable and so unable to relate to everybody else. I had a real victim's mentality around being so ill and this is so unfair and why me? And I think that coupled with the debilitating physical symptoms just took me to an absolute rock bottom. And it was in reaching rock bottom that I realised I guess that my life was in my hands and my hands only and everyone had done everything they could to try and help me and I was taking 25 different medications a day and I'd met all these different doctors but um, I had nothing in my life. I was sleeping 18 hours a day. I had chronic pain. I was so dizzy. I felt like I couldn't move. I looked more pregnant at that point than I did when I was almost eight months pregnant with my daughter. I mean, nothing in my body worked and I felt so apathetic that I just didn't really see any reason to be here. I just didn't care about anything and I had really switched off from the world and it was just this realization I had one day that I was never gonna have any of what I thought I'd have in my life and I didn't know what I wanted to do I wasn't an ambitious person growing up I didn't have all these big life plans um, but I just had taken for granted that I would be able to have a job and live independently and maybe get married and have children and yeah. I guess do all these things that we class as maybe kind of conventional life choices and that they would be choices for me to take as well. Um, and I was never going to be able to do any of those in that space. And it was in realizing that and I guess that level of personal responsibility that I'd hidden from for so long that got me interested in what else I could do. And I started reading people's stories all over the world and all sorts of different people, sorts of different conditions, some chronic, some acute, 
but different ages, sexes, you know, just completely different characters and all sorts of walks of life and all sorts of different illnesses. But there was this common thread where everybody had used facets of food and diet and lifestyle to change their health and improve their condition. And I just felt, look, if it's worked for them, maybe it'll work for me. I didn't really have anything to lose at this point in trying, Mm. but I couldn't cook. I didn't like vegetables. <laughs> it's really ironic. No way. Um, yeah, so I had no ambition and I didn't like vegetables. So the whole, so start a business that's gone on to be pretty successful all around getting people to eat more plants is like, it's so ironic that I think it used to feel disingenuous to some degree. Yeah. Um, anyway, and so I started writing Delicious Ciela and it was a recipe website as a way of teaching myself to cook because these simple everyday plant-based recipes just weren't available at this point. This is now early 2012. No one was talking about this way of eating. You couldn't find the recipes anywhere. So I thought, well, I'll teach myself to cook. And that somehow snowballed into the business as it is today. I met my husband through it. We've now got kids. We own the business together. We've built the business together. So it's been 12 years and this completely wild ride. A lot of people find it so crazy that if you're really successful now, you've always wanted to be ambitious. You know, people say it to me all the time, but you know, have we always so confident or have you always been so driven? I was like, I wasn't, this wasn't who I am. And I think there's that disconnect, isn't it? We think that if you are successful now, you've always wanted this, you've always wanted to do this. And I think the beauty of the digital age at that time was you were just trying, you were just almost thinking, well, I wanna eat a bit healthier. Why don't I share my journey? But how did that kind of happen? Because I'm trying to think from your perspective, you're feeling frustrated that you're at home, you can't find these recipes online and you didn't like to cook. So how did that kind of start, how that process start to think that, oh, okay, I'm going to share this with the world before I've even done it myself? Yeah, I mean, I think on your first point, I think that we're not brilliant at giving people permission to change and evolve and become different people, but that's such an inevitable part of life. And I think I always find it really interesting how we expect people to some degree to stay the same, but Mm -hmm. actually change can be so incredibly valuable and I often talk about the fact that I'm a accidental founder because I think it's so important I always felt growing up that exactly that the people that were always successful were the people that would go on to be successful so the people who'd been top of the class and head girl and the prefects and all the rest of it those were the people that would succeed in life and if you'd always been sort of pretty average you'd stay pretty average and I was distinctly average my my whole life um but my career hasn't been. And I think that's the interesting point that I'm very passionate about because I think particularly for women, we're quite quick to put ourselves down. It's very common to suffer with imposter syndrome. And I think it's just important to believe that you can be something you didn't think that you could and you can probably do more than you expect, but potentially than other people expect you to do. Um, But in terms of how it happened, I think one thing in retrospect I've realised is I've always been my own person probably to a fault like I'm definitely a hundred percent all or nothing I'm terrible at listening to what people tell me to do um and my mum says even when I was little you know be, she'd come and pick me up from nursery school and say all of the kids were playing in the sandpit but I just didn't really fancy it. I would just be by myself painting or whatever it was and I've always been like that you know as a teenager I've never been a particularly sociable person. I have my really close friends and that's a very important part of my life. But I've never been someone that loves a big crowded room and a party. Mm -hmm. And so I just never went to parties as a teenager. And I'd stay at home with my mum and watch The X Factor. Oh my God, I love that. Saturday night. Yeah, I mean, oh, I loved The X Factor so much. And it's interesting, again, because growing up, I think you have these very clear definitions of what's cool and what's good to some degree and I think I just never really wanted to fit those labels um but I used to feel more uncomfortable with it whereas now I'm very comfortable saying like my Mm. idea of heaven is cooking dinner having a bath getting into bed at eight o'clock like a few minutes after my children (laughs) the dream um so I think what I I didn't really think that much about it I guess is what I'm trying to say which is Mm. that I almost wish I had this like big story of how I started Delicious Yella and this big process of coming up with a name and a strategy. But ultimately, it was a very organic and unintentional process of thinking, I need this. I can't find it. Let me do it for myself. And in that, suddenly, two years later, the site had 130 million hits. 
and there were all these people looking at what I was doing and it sort of completely snowballed. 130 million hits in two years. Mm. I mean, I resonate with so much of what you're saying. I think that there's two things there. When you're younger, like you said, if you're the average in your class, you are told, though, that you are going to be average at everything. I was told that. You know, if you're not in the top set, you're never going to get a good job, Shivani. And if you don't get a good job, then you're not going to live in a nice house and you're not going to have nice things. And so that narrative, I think, is fed to us through school. And then the second thing you said around kind of stumbling I think a lot of people now are starting businesses intentionally, and I think it's amazing. And I still often look at people who start podcasts and think, wow, look at their branding, look at their artwork. You know, I, I need to do that. I have to do that. And actually, often when you do things organically and you do them kind of ad hoc, I guess, you know, you make your logo here and you kind of branch along here, it's really authentic to you. And it doesn't have to have this huge strategy and huge story. And I think we are also told that, you know, Apple had this marketing logo and there's a bite out of it of this particular reason. And when you start a business, you must have a marketing plan and you must have a business plan. And you must have four years of revenue projection. Otherwise, you're going to fail. And that's what stops so many people from beginning in the first place. I, I agree with that completely. And it's been so interesting. I mean, so I met my now husband in 2015 when my book came out and we started building the business as it is today together. So we've been doing it for, gosh, yeah, eight, coming up to nine years together. Amazing. And it's been really interesting to watch the space evolve. You know, we've built Delicious Yellow brick by brick. We had for a very short period of time a very small amount of investment. We then bought those investors out. We own the business 100%. And so wow. we've always had to live within our means. And at times that's felt really frustrating because you're up against these brands, you know, and you have literally a five pound marketing budget as in it's me on Instagram <laughs> posting pictures of things. And um, and you're up against a brand that might have a five million pound campaign against that launch. And obviously some of those are wildly successful. But now having been in this space long enough, what we've also seen is this absolutely extraordinary cycle of companies raising millions tens of millions up to you know way beyond that millions of pounds and they're a bust and they haven't succeeded and lots, of course there are ones that have but it's been this interesting idea that we're so I guess it's all it's not disconnected from what I was saying at the beginning this idea that we want other people to have the solutions for our life and I mm -hmm. think exactly that when people are starting a business they think right I need to go to this really expensive marketing agency yes. and have this whole brand world then I need to go and raise loads and loads of money because if I raise loads and loads of money then I'll be able to do this big digital marketing campaign if I can do this really big digital marketing campaign then I'll be really successful mm. and it's this idea that essentially to some degree other people are going to give you the answers to your success and I yeah. think what's just been so interesting to see is these companies where they've spent millions and millions of millions and it hasn't worked because it's not really been credible or it hasn't been a very good business case I mean they're operating at zero percent margin or whatever yeah. it is and I think it's I mean you just you learn so much as you go and you learn so much as you evolve and you learn so much as you watch the world change um, but I think that has been almost my biggest learning from absolutely everything associated with Delicious Yellow from a, both a personal and professional basis is that so many more of the answers sit within you than I think often we want to admit to ourselves because that's much harder. Absolutely. And I think you just made a really valid point there around a lot of people were looking to you for the solutions. I feel that when you become a public figure of some sort and you're trying to say, this is my brand and I'm trying to help you with this, people then see you as their solution for everything. And that happened for you, didn't it? Because people kind of attacked you during an era where clean eating and healthy eating was being really heavily debated as to whether it was actually good for us or not. Yeah, which is quite funny when you say it like that, to have really had a debate of whether or not it's a good idea yeah. to eat more vegetables. I yeah. mean, it's ridiculous. And again, in retrospect, I wish I'd had the confidence that I probably have today to, yeah. to stand up and really point out the complete 
irony and absolute insanity of debating whether or not it's a good idea to eat less ultra processed food and more vegetables but I think we've unequivocally answered that now and we know how important it is and now the challenge is much more how do we now shift the food environment to make it easier for people to look after their health because fundamentally it's incredibly challenging and there's way too much onus on the individual versus the system and and we do live in a very broken food system undoubtedly and so it's almost impossible to change the way that you eat to some degree um although we try yeah um but yes there was definitely quite a big period early on in my career where people were very vitriolic and for one better word just very nasty and it was deeply personal and I think it was just you know young women telling us what to do this is very frustrating how how long were you doing this for before that kind of period happened? Um, not long. I mean, I think it was sort of 2017, 2018. So I had been doing, I had started the site in 2012, but I guess it was in 2015 after my first book came out that it all sort of went to the next level. So mm-hmm. sort of two to three years in a more public facing space. Why do you think you were kind of at the heart of this attack because there were a lot of people who were talking about healthy eating I mean I that's why I worded the question in that way to say it was a debate of whether we should eat healthily or not it feels like now we're in this period in our life where we are pushing that narrative again you know you must not eat processed food you must not do this you must not do that I mean I've become so paranoid I mean I even said to you today would you like a drink and I reflected because you said I'd like a coffee and the first thing I I assumed you would say to me is I'll have a herbal tea and I recognized in that moment like wow how quick was I to assume that you wouldn't drink coffee and it's because at the moment all I'm seeing is how bad coffee is for you because everyone's telling me you know it's going to spike your blood sugar it's going to spike your insulin and you're going to have caffeine you're going to have a rush and I feel like there's just so much information out there and I'm always confused. Yes, and I don't think you're alone. Yeah. (laughs) Permanently confused. I think it's my biggest frustration from where I sit, Mm. watching the world of wellness, I guess, come into the world and evolve and change and become this sort of beast that it is. And I think... Yes, there's so much positives about it. For the first time, I think we've unequivocally answered the question of, yes, it matters what we eat. And and look, it's great because there are lots and lots of resources out there for people. And if you want to improve all facets of your health, there's loads of ideas free and available right now. And that's a brilliant thing. But equally, because we live in 24-hour news cycles and because of the algorithms that drive social media, the weird and the wacky, the fads, the clickbait driving headlines... And content ultimately do much better than, yes. a, you know, a video telling you to go on a 15 minute walk in your lunch break, get some outside air, some sunshine, maybe depending on the day, depending where you live. Um, but, you know, cook some vegetables, maybe make a stir fry, mm. you know, these incredibly simple piece of ad- pieces of advice. Go to sleep an hour earlier. Don't scroll on your Instagram as soon as you wake up in the morning. These are quite easy things to do that most of us could start to bring into our lives. Like most of us could walk for 15 minutes today. Yes. Most of us could go to bed 30, 60 minutes earlier, watch a little bit less Netflix. Mm -hmm. Most of us could stop scrolling a tiny bit. Yes. Most of us could make a tray bake or a stir fry or something really easy for supper. These are really achievable goals, but they're not very interesting to talk about, right? Mm -hmm. It's not very interesting to talk about a tin of lentils or cutting up some carrots and frying them with some garlic and ginger. That's not that interesting versus watching someone go into a freezing cold ice lake and do a Wim Hof session. You know, that is great content. It really is. You know, should you never drink coffee again is much more interesting than Let's do everything in moderation. Drink coffee, yes, but also drink water. That's not very interesting. Mm. And I think this is the problem is we've now live in this world of extremes. We've lost any sense of nuance and people feel like to be healthy, they've got to go to a more extreme place, which is ultimately largely incompatible with most people's day-to-day lives if you've got a busy job you likely have other demands and things you're juggling outside of your career whether that's looking after parents or other relatives or children other careers studying etc and I just feel that it's made the world of wellness feel so inaccessible to so many people and ultimately we so so badly in this country in now you know I'd say the western world but increasingly in, in the whole 
the whole world because we now have this extraordinary reliance on non-foods and ultra-processed foods. And, you know, in the UK, it's one in five people eat 80% of their calories from ultra-processed foods. So, and the easiest way to think about that is something ultra-processed or not is can you make it at home? Mm. You know, if you pick something up in the supermarket, look at the ingredients. And if you see X emulsifier, these three E numbers, you can't, you're not going to buy those at Tesco's or at Sainsbury's on your way home. So that's ultra processed food. That's just the easiest way to do it. Can I replicate this by buying these ingredients in a simple supermarket on the way home? And if you can't, it's an ultra processed food um, in a nutshell. But our reliance on that is so strong. Our intake of fiber is terrible. Our intake of fruits and vegetables is terrible. Our level of exercise is terrible. Like we are doing so badly at taking care of our health. And we're seeing that now in all the numbers in terms of the extraordinary crisis that's really unfolding with both our mental and our physical health. And so we just don't need more confusion. We don't need to be confused about whether we have coffee or not. Ultimately, if you're eating like a plant rich, mostly whole food diet where you're cooking at home a lot, you're eating much, much less ultra processed food. If you have a coffee or not, you know, obviously some people are really caffeine sensitive and that's different. But for most people, you're fine. Stop worrying. There's much more bigger things to worry about. But I think it's this fixation on rules and rigid approaches and things being quite dogmatic and I think that stems from a very long-standing diet culture a complicated world of body image and ultimately we just seem to come back to loving rules and regulations fads trends 100% this or zero percent I'm on a bandwagon I'm off a bandwagon oh I've been really good all week oh no I blew it all out by going out for dinner on Saturday as opposed to being like let me enjoy it I mean the worst question for me is when people say oh what's your guilty pleasure I'm like that's an oxymoron it's not a pleasure if it makes you feel guilty like if something induces guilt that's not a pleasure there's nothing pleasurable about the feeling of guilt if you're going to have a big piece of chocolate cake enjoy the big piece of chocolate cake savor it think wow this is so delicious that doesn't mean you can't eat broccoli tomorrow and so it's just this lack of balance that we have in this sort of extraordinarily complicated world that we live in and the more we can try and just strip it back to move your body sleep more eat more vegetables, eat less food that you have no idea what on earth it's made out of. Those things are a lot more achievable than being like, I must do this, I must do that, I must never do the next thing. I just feel that there's so many complexities because people love polarizing things. So last week I had a nutritionist on and I purposely could have chosen a clickbait title, but I just chose a clip where I said, what are some of the easy things that people can implement that are cost effective? And she said, love your freezer. Okay, so I uploaded this clip and the comment section is wild. I thought that this was going to be a bit of a rubbish clip, if I'm honest. I was like, oh, God, I didn't. Normally, my structure is I choose some clips and I thought, you know what? I'm just going to choose this clip because I actually feel like it's helpful. Do I think it's going to do really well? No, but I think it's really helpful because I'm asking her what people can do. That's cost effective. That's easy. She just said uh, frozen fruit and vegetables are obviously have more vitamins and nutrients because they're frozen on the day. Fresh fruits and vegetables, they're in a supermarket shelf and they're there for a long time. She was not talking about if you grow your own vegetables. She was not talking about if you buy it from a local's farmer's market. She was talking about the average person in the Buying UK bags of peas. who goes into the, the supermarket. They're buying lettuce that's been on the shelf for a few days. She was saying, you know, instead of buying broccoli that's fresh, if you can't afford it, also buy frozen. And the comment section is like, this is against Ayurveda. This is actually rubbish. You don't know what you're talking about. And I was saying to people, share your credentials. And they were like, you share yours. I'm like, I don't have any. I'm not a nutritionist. That's why I brought somebody on. And I just feel that anything you say in terms of people's health, they either feel like you're telling them off, they either feel like you're being judgmental, or they'll give you a reason as to why in their ancient script it doesn't actually align. And I think this is where it gets confusing because for me, then I was thinking, oh wait, have I said the wrong thing? Have I done the wrong thing? Is frozen fruit bad for you? I don't know. Yeah, I think that really summarizes the world of food. It's such an emotive topic. And I understand why I really do, and it's so nuanced. And we take it very, very personally. And as a result, it becomes very difficult to talk about. And I definitely found for a while that I wouldn't say anything, you know, because it was like exactly that. You don't want to offend anyone. But actually, arguably, there's a point in which that's really unhelpful too. Like, Mm. and because nuance gets lost, it is difficult. Like, is it bad for you to once, you know, every now and again eat ultra processed food? No. 
Is it bad for you if 60 to 80% of your calories come from ultra processed food? You're eating about half the fiber you need, you know, one in five of us getting our five a day. Yeah, that is bad. Mm. You know, is that going to be good for your health? I thought saw this um, meme on Instagram yesterday and I just thought sort of ridiculous, but so true. Was this, I think it was someone... I think she was meant to be a mum. And she was so she was saying, I've had a really bad day. And it was like, have you left the house today and been outside? No. no. <laughs> have you drunk any water? No. Have you eaten any vegetables? No. Have you spent way too long scrolling Instagram? No. Did you sleep well last night? No, I stayed up too late watching Netflix. And it kind of went through these things. And like I'm saying, these aren't weird and wacky things. Like no. go outside, cook yes. some vegetables, etc. But our lives are so busy we all forget to do these things and then we think, oh, we don't feel great, right? I need this mad diet. I need to go on a cleanse. I need to never eat X, Y, or Z again as opposed to these simple everyday habits. Basic things. And I think it's just trying to drown out that noise because exactly as you said, you know, someone will say, oh, well, I heard smoothies are really bad because they're cold. And so in Ayurveda, that's terrible for, you know, certain doshas. And then other people are saying, but I thought smoothies were great because it's an easy way to get vitamins and minerals in your diet when you're really busy and I don't have time to cook from scratch. And other people are like, but is it different if you buy a pre-made one or make your own? And it's sort of this world in which you're it just all gets so confusing and I'm not surprised that people end up turning off from it which is such a shame because ultimately that's the antithesis of what we need which is moving people closer to eating real food again moving their body sleeping more and sleep such a foundational part of our health so I think my advice would be just trying to drown out the noise Mm -hmm. don't feel you have to attach yourself to any rules don't feel like you have to attach yourself to any one way of living it doesn't need to be dogmatic it's really quite simple ultimately think about your foundations move your body that doesn't need to be a barry's boot camp that doesn't need to be like a hardcore class that could be a walk on your lunch break that could be a 10 minute at home yoga video yes when you get home from work it can be very straightforward move your body preferably get outside try and sleep a bit more Mm -hmm. you know don't watch netflix all night (laughs) try not to scroll your phone when you wake up in the morning like give yourself a second to wake up and just drink some more water and eat some more vegetables. Yeah. If you're doing all of that, you are winning. And ultimately at that point, if you want to go down various rabbit holes, that's fine. But we need to move everybody to doing that before we start to get really focused on the ins and outs of a thousand different variations on what essentially I see as the same thing. It's like every weekend you'll read, you know, the various newspapers and say, this is the new diet. I think the the other week it was like, the Atlantic diet and it was very much based around a sort of Icelandic way of living and I was reading it and I was like this is the same why are we dressing this up as anything different it's the Mediterranean diet but instead of more fish it's pork but it's not loads of pork it's very focused on you know seasonal fruits and vegetables and berries and whole food ingredients Mm. it's the same thing we're all talking about the same thing eating more simple everyday whole food ingredients like our great grandparents would have done when they didn't have all these convenience food it's a thousand variations on the same thing eat real food the two things people struggle with though are time and money and the main argument against healthy eating is it's too expensive and i don't have time yeah and look time is a really difficult one ultimately time there's I think there are interesting things. One of the, and I am far from perfect, but one of the things that I realized and I found myself doing when I get busy, I can become quite frantic is probably the best word for it. I find myself like busying myself more and kind of going into a bit of a hole. And so I started, you know, sleeping with my phone. I'd wake up in the morning and I'd just start scrolling first thing. And it was really interesting. My day, my mornings just became really stressful and therefore my days became really stressful because I wasn't up before my kids. I wasn't therefore showered and dressed. And so suddenly mm. I'm trying to get them ready for school. The homework's in the backpack. The water bottles are filled. They have the right PE kit on. I'm dressed, ready for the day, blah, blah, blah. And you just lost time. And it was really interesting checking myself. and think, why am I doing this? Do not turn your phone on until you leave the house. And suddenly you've spent that seven minutes that you lost like that to Instagram, thinking that you hadn't spent any time on it whatsoever. And you've had a shower and you've moisturized Mm. and you've put on a nice outfit and you feel really good. And so I'm not saying that time, there's like a magic concept around time, but I just wonder, I think all of us or most of us are guilty of losing time that we could spend on making ourselves feel so much better or doing things that actively feel like they improve our life calling a friend reading a book listening to a podcast we love going outside going for a walk going for a run 
cooking dinner to scrolling Facebook to scrolling TikTok to scrolling Instagram. I think most of us spend, you know, statistically speaking, hours a day on those sorts of apps. And so For sure. I'm not saying that there's a magic answer here. Like, as I said, most people are juggling a lot of things. If you've got a very busy job, there isn't a magical answer to no. time. Except for I just wonder how many of how many other people are doing what I find myself doing sometimes where you end up losing all of these pockets of time to completely pointless exercises that don't really get you anywhere and don't make you feel better ultimately. And so I think that's one thing I'd say um, from a time perspective. Um, from a cost perspective, look, I think again, coming back to what we were just talking about, there is a world in which healthy eating is also associated with the kind of weirder, wackier fans, fads, trends as we were talking about. And so I think it is important to remind people that healthy eating isn't adaptogenic mushrooms it's not green powders that cost 100 pounds a month if you want to do all those things that's totally your prerogative but what we're actually talking about here is chickpeas and carrots and lentils and brown rice and these sorts of ingredients and of course there is a section of people who have been so affected by the cost of living crisis to whom that's incredibly expensive and I don't mean to bypass that but equally some of those ingredients are actually very very cheap and so when you start looking at making like a big veggie stew for example with tinned tomatoes etc you can get down to a pound a portion Mm. and actually it can be really cost effective and really nutritious and quite easy to do and so I think it's There is no magic wand. There is no magic answer. It does take discipline. It does take time. It does take a level of planning. But ultimately what it gives you back in terms of your energy level and your mood is extraordinary. Yeah. And that's the answer people don't want to hear. I want to talk a little bit around the business and how you kind of set it up. Because you said you didn't plan to start a business. You started this blog. And I know there'll be a lot of people that are watching that will think, okay, I have an idea. But can this translate into a business? How did that kind of start? Yes. I mean, there's so much to say if that's what you're thinking about. And the one thing I would say before we get any further into it is that there is a lot of glamorization around entrepreneurship and starting a business and your hashtag girl boss. And look, so much of that is a great thing. Um, You know, entrepreneurs and small, medium sized businesses are really important part of the UK economy. There are nowhere near enough female founders. You Mm -hmm. can't be what you can't see. Let's inspire another generation of women there is so much about it that's great but and I think it's a very important underlined capital letter but the glamorization is so not reflective of the reality Mm. which is that starting a business and running a business and scaling a business and I don't mean a lifestyle business I mean a business that really is in high growth and that is employing you know a fair number of people and starts to have this level of responsibility that is all consuming. It I'd say you spend most of your life feeling like you live in some kind of tumble dryer. And the level of pressure and stress and responsibility is so all consuming. If you really care about what you do and fulfillment for you looks like fulfilling that mission and your sense of fun is solving those kinds of problems as opposed to being at your friend's wedding, It is the best thing you can do in your life. I really do believe that. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity. But I just don't think I can overemphasize enough how much it doesn't look like what you think it might look like on Instagram. What do you mean Um, by that? It's just, it's so much harder than you can ever explain to people. And it's not because anyone's lying. It's because you can't talk about the realities of it. You, because it's, you know, that would be, that would be a terrible idea. Um, your customers won't trust you your team can't know about it you know there are every day is a firefight you know every day is like waking up being punched all day (laughs) just even doing it again the next day you know all you're doing is solving problems I think the best businesses aren't the people with the best ideas they're the people who got up and solved the most number of problems the most quickly and I don't know any founder who's had a different experience to that. But of course, you don't see that on Instagram. These aren't problems that you can talk about publicly. You can't talk about challenges in your teams. Yes. Effective cash flow, payment terms changing, this happening at various different manufacturers, all the rest of it. This is this is not IG content. <laughs> and as a result, I think you don't see so much of really what happens in terms of taking a business to the next level, you know, and what you you miss out on along the way like you don't have space for lots of friends you don't have space for a social life like Mm -hmm. it is 
it is your life. When people always say to me, like, do you have boundaries between work and life? I'm like, no, my work is my life. My life is my work. I don't have anything, obviously, apart from my children now outside of that. Not really, because you don't have any space for it. Mm. And if you think you have space for it, then, or you want space for it, I think that's where I would push back and be like, I don't think I would recommend starting a business because ultimately you have no idea when the problems will come. You know, we realised we'd cancelled 17 attempts at taking time off and going on holiday within our first four years. And the number of, you know, we missed a Christmas, we missed friends' weddings, we missed everything. Because ultimately, when the problems happen, you have to say, OK, well, this is my responsibility. I've got to solve this whole sit here until it's done you know we cancelled our first wedding anniversary trip like everything and that's just part of it and as I said there's so much privilege and opportunity and extraordinary life experience that comes with that but I just think that this idea of what you see on Instagram is so different to the reality and I think sometimes I find that almost frustrating to the degree that I think people then sometimes get into it and they feel lonely in their Mm. pursuit of of their business um I think there's two images we see on Instagram. One is this hustle culture of you can't have a life if you start a business. And then the other other thing I'm seeing is like you can make money very quickly if you start a career online. I actually am of the belief that if you want to build something extraordinary and you want to be the best at whatever you do in any part of your life, you will have to sacrifice something. There are sacrifices. 100%. And I think we see these get rich quick online schemes that is like, just start a TikTok and you'll, I make five million pounds from uploading one video a week. I'm like, amazing. Congratulations. I actually met someone the other day and he was like, you know, I'm just shocked you're not making 50K a month. I was like, sorry? Like, <laughs> sorry? <laughs> like, why do you think I'd be making that sort of money? It's shocking. It's so easy for you. I was like, really? How much do you make a month? I was like, if it's so easy for me to make... It's just absurd, I think, the numbers that people throw. Because they're like, well, you just do this one thing and you'll get much, you'll get rich quick. And I think there's this focus on money and there's this focus on, you know, doing things quickly rather than actually doing things at a slower pace and doing things properly. And this is where I think values are compromised with online content as well. What you just spoke around, around making those sacrifices with friends and making those sacrifices with your family and making those sacrifices in your relationship. I mean, you work with your husband. How is that? Yes, I don't think you can overemphasize. And that is life. Life is a series of compromises and decisions. And Mm. ultimately, I think that's such an important thing to realize. And I think you can have it all in your life, but you can't have it all in any chapter. Yes. And looking at life like that is so incredibly important. Like I know this is one chapter of my life where I have small children and I have a fast growing business and that is my life. And there'll be other chapters which involve a lot more freedom and travel and social experiences and and it's going to be different and that's great and that's my choice and I've made that choice and I live with that choice and I'm grateful for that choice but I think because we have this what we think is insight into other people's lives but it's not it's not reality Mm. um we think that other people don't have to make those choices and I just think that exactly as you said I just think that focus on Everything in life involves compromises and choices is so incredibly important. Mm. Um, and no one's alone in, in that. I think, look, everybody is so different. And I know people look at me and they're like, how do you work with your husband? You're mad. And I, I, I do understand why you'd think that. But equally for us, we don't know any different. I mean, we met over the idea of making a snack together. So that was how we were introduced. So Amazing. we, you know, we've never... We've never really had a conversation like where work and life isn't blurred into one space. And I think I always knew I had this vision for Delicious Yellow. I had this mission I wanted to fulfill. I had this brand. I had this community. I had a premise. But I I knew I needed a partner. I knew that I needed. I would never get it to where I wanted to get it to. I would never. Because I I wanted it to be massive. I want it to be massive. That's how we're going to really instigate change. That's how we will shift the food system. It's not by being a small business. The bigger we are, the more impact that we can have. And I really am obsessed with changing the food system and and showing that there's a different way of doing it. And so I want Delicious Yellow to be enormous. And I knew I wouldn't be able to do that on my own. And I don't say that to be self-deprecating. I just, there's a level of self-awareness where I realized I wasn't interested in different facets of the business. And I I do have a very um, one-track mind. I get very focused on something and I'm not brilliant at looking outside of that. And so I always felt that it would succeed 
with a partner yes. and when we met it was so clear that you know Matt was exactly the same like his focus was really on the business side of it we often talk about the difference as in him and I between a founder and an entrepreneur and I think an entrepreneur is someone who can make a business almost out of anything and everything they see they have ideas about and a founder is someone who is so clearly attached to one specific mission and solving one specific problem and I think we were very lucky, which is that a founder met an entrepreneur yeah. and therefore together we could take this mission, this brand and take it to a totally different level. And that has been so important. And so in the early days, that was maybe stranger because we, you know, when you're a team of three or four, you obviously do everything together. And although technically you have a title when you're in a startup, no one actually has, yeah. you know, no one actually does a job spec. You yeah. all do anything and everything that's needed at any given moment. But as the business has scaled and grown, we have more and more people. Actually, our day jobs are really separate to one another. So we share the sort of total journey. We share the mission. We share the good and the bad, the real stresses and the real wins which I'm really grateful for because it has taken over our whole life. Mm. You have this completely unwritten subconscious understanding of one another and what the other person needs. And it is this true sense of a team and we are the other half of the other one, but we're much more than the sum of our parts because together we've enabled each other to do so much more. Um, but ultimately it is nice because we also have a lot of autonomy. I mean, he's in our factory today okay. looking at flows and, you know, expanding the production lines and Amazing. all these sorts of things. And I'm here talking to you about building Delicious Seattle and why we do what we do, why it's important and how to navigate the world of health and wellness. So it's ended up being quite different jobs, which I think is, which I think is a nice thing at this point. Absolutely. When you, I, I was going to ask you actually a difficult question but I think you've kind of answered it. I was going to say, did you ever find it hard to rely on him? No. Like, did he ever find it hard to rely on you? Yeah. Yeah, much more so. He's the steadiest person on the planet. He is just unwavering and he's so uncomplicated. I mean, he has Men so are, aren't they? They're just so uncomplicated. I know. He has so many great qualities, but this like the ease and uncomplicated nature with which he looks at the world is one of my favorite things and it's one of the things that I've learned the most from being around him because I'm definitely by nature a more complicated person who sees the world as a more complicated place than he does he's very straightforward um and I think I definitely and as I said I'm definitely a complete all or nothing person like I'm very emotional and again Same. he's very grounded and sensible <laughs> um and so I think there was definitely a period particularly after my second daughter was born May and we were in lockdown still and I just had completely lost my sense of who I was at work why I did what we did mm. because I'd had my first daughter Sky about six, seven months before lockdown started. I had been back at work, but you're in that kind of strange mm. haze of postpartum and the juggler is never more of a juggle than at that point. And then I'd had my second daughter and I'd sort of, as a result, not been in the kind of epicenter of the business for almost two years um, between lockdowns and my job had changing so much during lockdown and not be able to be out there in the world and spread the brand and do so much of what I do and so I definitely felt very disconnected from Delicious Ziella and I mm. think for him that was really difficult because he carried so much weight through COVID and yeah. consistently pivoting and juggling and changing everything that we did as rules and regulations changed on a day-to-day -day basis and he had to, up until that point we'd had really joint responsibility and it felt like he had 99 percent responsibility and it was really you know really difficult and so I I mean I don't think he would say it, but I would say that he definitely I wouldn't have felt as kind of equal partners in it which I think we both have always felt we needed to be a lot of the time we believe equality is 50 50 with anything, with our relationships, in business, in an organization. We believe that if that's your role, and I've said we're gonna do something together, at all times it must be 50-50. And I've seen so many people talk about marriage and they're like, it's not, it's not 50-50. Some days it's 20%, some days he's at 80%, some days I'm at 70% and he's at 30%. And it's this constant juggle that we have to manage. I wanna talk around your cafes that you opened because I remember seeing a lot of articles around that too. And I, I just do want to say, I think the press were very unfair to you at a lot of times. When I was Googling your articles, 
I was quite shocked at a lot of the headlines. It seemed like an actual personal attack. And I and I see what you mean by when you said it wasn't just like a little bit about clean eating. It was like deliciously Ella is the pinnacle of everything we're talking about. How did you manage that? And, t- and talk to me about opening the cafes and then, you know, eventually having to close them. Yeah, look, this was a really, again, I think I just look back on it all and I just wish I'd had more confidence. Um but you live and you learn. And I had very low self-esteem when I started all of this. And I had a lot of imposter syndrome and I just didn't want to stick my head above the parapet at this point. But when we started, we felt there were two clear routes. We were going to, we could scale a physical um, space and a cafe business, or we could scale a retail business selling product into supermarkets, both of which were focused on showing how you could eat simple, natural, whole food, plant-based ingredients on a day-to-day basis. What became really, so, and we did them both in tandem to start with right. against every sensible person's advice, which I would agree with. Um, and what we always knew from day one was we weren't going to scale both. That okay. was never going to be possible. Nobody succeeds doing both. Or they, you know, Pratt, who's been in market or Itsu for decades, now has supermarket products, but it's a sort of second business. That's what Gales is doing now, but it's not at the same time. Nobody scales mm. both at the same time. That's not a good idea, but... We've always we I think we felt it could be either. So let's start with both and let's see where we get to. And what became clear really, really quickly was we wanted control of the company. At this point, it was still what we were doing was very niche, trying to make things without preservatives, without yes. emulsifiers, without stabilizers. It was pushing water up a hill every single day. And it was very, very difficult. And now people understand it and they understand why it's so important. And so it's a very different story. And people now realize it is possible. But it didn't feel clear to us which one would be a success, so we started both. And we knew with the cafes we needed to reach about six sites to um, make it a profitable business. We always uh-huh. knew that. That wasn't, that wasn't anything new to us. Um, but what became really clear, we got to three. We would have had to keep raising money to because funding and build-out of hospitality is extraordinarily capital-intensive. And as a result, as I said, we wanted control and we would obviously be giving away more and more control, particularly when the brand's in its infancy. At this point, it would be different. But at that point, it was very important. Um, And the food products business had taken off at rocket speed. And we looked at it and it was such an obvious decision to close two of the sites, keep one as a brand home and keep scaling the products business. It wasn't a it wasn't a failure. And I don't say that because I don't want, we have failed at so many things. I have failed at so many things. That's a really important part of life. This one wasn't a failure, but people loved it. They were like, delicious yellow, <laughs> basically goes into administration. She is really a moron after all. Um, and it was this bizarre celebration yes. of personal failure. And obviously, look, this, you know, although it was a decision it meant we had to make lots of jobs were redundant it was a really horrible moment because you know having to to tell people they've lost their jobs I guess this speaks to my point of like what running a business actually looks like is these sorts of horrible decisions are involved and processes and conversations um and that would be entirely inappropriate conversations for Instagram of course um but it was it was just so strange I remember even one of my best girlfriends saying to me like my friends are kind of laughing this like it's just we just don't like people succeeding in this country and that's a kind of general rule of thumb I think but particularly when it comes to women and so there were all these articles being like yay she sucks yay for her failure almost but no one mentioned once oh but by the way over the last six months like they've got their products listed in all the major grocers and they're suddenly in over 2,000 stores that's a really unusual like rapid rise and and you know it's one of the fastest growing brands in this space and all the rest of it's comp- it would never wasn't mentioned one of the ceos of the big four and this in the big four supermarkets called us to say um have you gone into administration um and and like it put at risk so many of our retailer relationships because they thought the business had gone bust it was just this really interesting moment anyway but i just didn't want to i just didn't want to get an argument with anyone and i didn't want to stand out and so i just sort of let it be and so it's really interesting and now when people bring up they're like you know that part of the business failed and I'm like Like, no it did it actually didn't like 
it we knew it we knew from day one that three sites each site was profitable at site level but the mm. operational complexities and having a central kitchen and ops managers etc across the various sites means as i said we needed to get to about six sites for that business to be profitable we knew that before we opened the doors to the first one and so it was just this really interesting moment it was a really conscious decision one part was doing really well so we went from three to one and then ran with the other but i have the one now we've kept investing in it we've turned it into a restaurant so i just look at it and i just yeah i think it spoke it speaks to this sort of complicated way in which we look at other people's careers and um but as i said i've had a lot of imposter syndrome in my career and i know that people are quick to judge and and all mm. the rest of it and so I've been quite slow to say when we have done well because I've I'm just waiting for that to become another criticism I would actually say that you're probably one of the few people when I've looked at the articles that I've seen the most shocking headlines especially around this closure it was like people were celebrating yeah and I found it's so it bizarre because really you're bizarre. celebrating people losing their jobs it's so weird it was very weird because I remember we spoke about this at that dinner and then when I was looking I was like my gosh it's, it, it reminded me okay this is an extreme example please don't attack me for it it reminded me a little bit okay about have you seen the Kate Middleton v the Meghan Markle like the difference in the headlines and I remember looking at those and it was like Kate Middleton hugs her bump and it was like Meghan Markle can't keep her hands off her bump she's so obsessed with her baby and I was like my gosh like it was very clouded and I, I just want to say one thing around um investing in yourself and investing in businesses because somebody told me this and it blew my mind they said to me that a lot of us are so scared to invest in a business because we're scared it's going to fail but why don't we look at it as education how many of us invest so much money in our education and we see that going to university studying these books doing an mba will invest 20 30 40 50k but starting a business and saying i learned from that is like you're a failure Oh, 100%. Why are they both not educational? It is, and like, there's nothing, nothing... And I'm not saying you failed, by the way. No, I'm just no, no, saying that. No, oh, God, but also we have failed. Yeah. Everyone fails. Every company fails. Every individual fails. We've launched things that go out of market. Like, yeah. there are, I, you know, there's definitely many a product we've launched that have been failures with a full stop at the end. Like, <laughs> it's one line we launched. I don't think we sold a single product. Like, it was... It was, it was like kind of comical. Like no one yeah. bought them. Literally nobody. Mm. And within six months, they were out of market. And you see that all the time. Like massive brands do it too. They'll yes. launch things. And they're complete flops. And they go. It happens all the time. No one's journey to success is linear in any shape or form. And so every time you think that it should be, and then when it gets hard, you think that you're doing it wrong. I think that's part of the problem. It yeah. really, really is. Um and that's why the podcasting space is really nice because you can have these much more nuanced, long-form conversations yes. where you can talk about this in a much clearer way than I think so many other channels, which is which is really good and I think are really important conversations. But everybody fails. Mm. And I, I have to ask you one hard question because I know a lot of people, a lot of people think that some people have a level of privilege. And if you have a level of privilege, things are easy for you. So they'll say, Ella, you were privileged, so you were able to do everything. Is that true? I don't think it's true. Um, but I don't think it's an easy answer, is it? Because no. nothing in life is. And I, I understand, I completely understand why people feel that way. And that's yeah. why it's not something I kind of generally talk about at length. But mm -hmm. it is, I guess it's just this interesting world isn't it that we live in and I think it speaks to so much the conversation we've had so far you know again being totally transparent you know the the privilege comes from my mother's side where my great 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 grandfather was the founder of Sainsbury's and I so cool, by have way, been I embarrassed <laughs> of that my whole life why which I am now embarrassed to say I was embarrassed and I think it's because it's because it was always something that people used as a stick to beat you with and a reason to dislike you and a reason to make a huge number of assumptions about you. And again, so many of the way that things are written about are so incorrect. I mean, no one in my family has worked in the business since my, I mean, it went public when my mum was a teenager, you know, decades before I was born and came into this world. So, you know, it's it's not what it seems, if that yes. makes sense. But equally, like the association with one of the UK's most successful businesses, but also now one of the UK's most philanthropic families ever. Like, 
I should be so proud of that. That should be something that I should be so thrilled and honoured to have any kind of learning from Absolutely. my grandfather and his siblings and his cousin who really turned it into their generation really turned it into what it is today and but instead it's something that I've been sort of ashamed of my whole life because it's always been something that I thought people would just assume I was this sort of terrible spoil person yeah. and which is really interesting and you know I I try and get our kids to be really proud of what we do and it's really sweet they they really are when they see liciously Ella as they call it Aww. on shelf like they're so proud I mean we were in a store the other day and we saw one of our products and May who's my younger one who's three and a half picked them up and goes my beautiful daddy makes these and I was oh, it was just too much it. it was so sweet and it's you know really trying to instill in them the level of hard work That's you know so Matthew cute. leaves at six in the morning to drive up to our factory a couple of days a week like we you know we want them to work on the line we want them to get what it takes to build something yes um but I never want them to be embarrassed of it and if what we do enables them to have privilege in their life I want them to understand how lucky they are to get the opportunities they are but not to be embarrassed of us as a result so it's an interesting world and you know look I lived at home as I started building Delicious Ciela and being able to live safely at home with your parents that's a massive privilege Mm -hmm. of course it is but they have had no part in building Delicious Ciela actively used to you know my dad introduced me to my husband and in I found his initial email the other day he was like this isn't one of my connections I know you don't want anything any help and like I just wouldn't even speak to anyone they would want me you know say oh I could introduce you to x person they might be able to give you some interesting advice I was like I don't want to talk to them and it almost the point that like I was trying to prove a point in and of myself which was probably a bit pointless as well Mm. but you know, and people always assume, oh, it's been really easy you built retail business because of Sainsbury's like, well, no one's worked in our family. No one's worked in the business for decades and decades and decades and decades and decades. They don't own the business. It's been public for a very, very long time. They have no role in decision making. They were actually one of the last supermarkets to stock us. Yeah. Um, there's nothing in the relationship there. It's no different. Sometimes it's been more challenging than the other retailers. So. Yes. But I've never, you know, I'm not going to go into that. Like, what's the point? You know, of course, there's elements of my life that's been really lucky. There have been elements of it that have been really difficult, but that's not my story to tell. Mm -hmm. That's not, yeah, it's complicated. The world is really complicated. Example I always give is you're all on a start line, right? Some of you may have privilege and you'll go a few steps ahead. You all have to run. Someone might introduce you to someone and say, hey, I've got this introduction. You still have to work hard. You still have to come up with new ideas. You still have to innovate. You still have to push yourself. I don't know anyone who has been given a business and they've just sat there doing nothing and they've become really successful. It doesn't happen. Well, it's impossible. I mean, it would fail. Like, and I think that was my what I felt. I felt like we had to reach a certain scale, which would prove that clearly we had done it. You know, I remember the moment last year where we'd officially sold 90 million products since we started you know we'd hired almost 100 people in the team at this point we had our factory we had our restaurant we had our office we were shipping to 40 countries around the world you know we're now outselling most of our competitors in most of the categories that we sit in who have multi-million pound budgets and we still do not have those because we own the business 100 percent and so I look at it and I'm like, no, no one can give you that. They can give you, you know, like encouragement. They yes. can give you all that. But like, you know, we had a personal guarantee against our house for years. Like there's nothing there's nothing there that's like, oh, here's the easy answer. But mm-hmm. it's, as I said, it's a very complicated topic and I don't blame anybody for imagining to have a lot of preconceived ideas yeah. around it. And so it's just a topic I found easier to kind of, steer clear of it can become a bit scary what are some of the easy things that people can do they don't have to be you know this doesn't have to be a clickbait clip what are some of the easy things that people can do that are really going to help them live longer yeah look as you said and as we talked about at the beginning the world of health and wellness is very com- confusing it's very dogmatic it's very clickbaity it kind of sways in the wind one week to the next and yeah. i think Almost if there was one thing you were going to do, it would be to ignore all of that. Like, not to sound overly controversial, but just to simplify things. Mm. Like, sleep more, move more, eat more vegetables, eat less foods where you have no idea what any of the ingredients are in them. Like, just go back to basics. And I always think, you know, 
if you take one thing away it's the idea that like it's normal to want to feel better yeah. maybe you feel tired all the time maybe you feel like low energy low mood bloated you're lethargic you just want to feel again like that get up and go that spark that's normal there's nothing wrong with that you shouldn't feel guilty for that but just see your health and looking after your body as as something that's you know hopefully something you're going to do for decades and decades and decades so if there's anything that you're thinking you need to shift in your life and habits you'd like to take up just ask yourself like could you still be doing this 10 years from now 20 years from now 30 years from now and if the honest answer is no no I'm not going to get up at four o'clock in the morning and have a three-hour routine before I go to work don't don't start because you're just going to feel like you failed and you're off the bandwagon so just start with habits that feel genuinely feasible and achievable in your life it's that idea of one percent better these things where they don't look like much on the surface but these tiny habits accumulate to fundamentally changing the foundations of your life but they're habits that feel plausible enjoyable sustainable and daily ish is a great way to look up things you don't have to do it every single day Mm. but just keep coming back to these basics these foundations these staples ignore the noise and make it work for you and it's easy to think it won't make that much difference if I just sleep a little bit more if I walk a bit more every day if I Mm. cook a few more vegetables but you will be amazed at what you achieve in a year you will see no difference in a week and that's a really important thing because we all want magic answers we've talked about this is really no different in our professional lives as it is for our health and our relationships and kind of all facets of the way that we live we want life can feel so overwhelming it can really get on top of us and I think therefore we want to be able to quick click our fingers and have a quick fix have a magic answer have a silver bullet and they just don't exist like how many people win the lottery not many and ultimately I think that just speaks to it doesn't it it's like Mm. it's long term it's a it's just it's foundations isn't it and I think there are no easy wins in life and your health is no different so just go back to basics and think about can I do this forever to keep looking after myself I know there's loads of terms of like you are what you eat and your body is a temple and I also think that we all know that there's a link and a correlation between our mental health and food but recently something I I realized myself without kind of looking at it so objectively was self-love is actually very, very linked to our diet. And I noticed that because one day my partner said, do you wanna get Domino's? And I love Domino's by the way. And I said, no, I'm gonna make flatbread pizzas myself. And I did that because I was like, I really wanna take care of my body. And I really want to put these good things in my body. So do you, did you notice that there was a big link? Oh, absolutely. Look, I don't think you can look at anything in health and wellness in isolation. And I think oftentimes we do, and that's part of the problem as to why people feel like they can't make changes. Mm. It's the same where, you know, sleep is so much the foundation of good health, both mentally and physically. If you're really sleep deprived, you are clinically proven to have more cravings, to um, want more sugar, to want less healthy food, So there's nothing weird about you if you've had four or five hours sleep and then you're wanting to reach for all the bags of sweets. That's normal. That's like human biology in motion. But because the food landscape we live in is so challenging, you're obviously just faced with that all day, every day. So then it's really easy to end up eating so much of the foods that really aren't very good for us. Um, So I think it's exactly that. And if you have a really poor sense of self, and self-esteem the desire to take care of yourself is invariably lower which is why I believe everything is so linked it's the same when you're overwhelmed and you're overly stressed again this all has such impact on you both mentally and physically stress affects your cortisol levels and that affects your appetite and it's a your blood sugar control and it's just this complete interlink and so When you think about taking care of yourself, you do have to think about taking care of your whole self and you can eat all the broccoli in the world. But ultimately, if you aren't controlling your stress, if you aren't sleeping, if you aren't moving your body, broccoli can only do so much. And I guess it's it's that same premise in motion. There aren't any easy wins. Yeah, I think that's kind of what we've really discovered from this whole podcast is unfortunately if you want to receive the results whether that's good health whether that's a successful business whether that's a happy life whether that's you know waking up and feeling fulfilled there are sacrifices that need to be made and I think that throughout this episode you've highlighted that in all parts of a career 
And there's so much more I wanted to speak to you about. And I think next time we need to do a whole episode on actually, you know, what we can do to boost our mood and, and, and you know, increase our health um, across all elements of our life. But thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it and for being so open and vulnerable. Such a pleasure. Thank you so, so much for having me. Thanks.